And I'm on. Can you hear me? Excellent. So, I, I don't know if I really knew this, but uh, I guess honor students sit in the back of the room. Is that true? And I heard that you had a speaker that made you stand up and you had to get face to face and feel each other out. Well, we won't be doing that because scientists are rather uncomfortable with, you know, interactions. <laughs> but it's my pleasure and delight to be here tonight to talk to you about research. Um, I remember as an undergraduate, I had a number of experiences. Most of it I didn't really remember. I remember sleeping on top of the 70 meter ski jump at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And I don't know really why we did that other than it was there. There were other experiences I didn't remember, but one that really changed my life was participating in undergraduate research. I had no idea what it meant. I had a uh, teaching assistant tell me, you know, Wheeler, maybe you should think about coming to our lab and doing some things in the research lab. I, I just had no idea what that meant and where that could bring me. Um, and so I think here today, tonight, I would like to encourage you to think about areas of scholarship that you might be able to help out with. I don't know if you've all seen this. Is this something that's common knowledge for the honors program? Have they seen this? Okay, I think this is really intriguing. So you all were given this question. What's the first five words that popped into your mind when you heard the word honors? And I guess I forgot my question mark. And so the larger the words, the more people responded in that area. So challenging, which is good because we would like to challenge you. Dedication, absolutely. It takes dedication on your end and EIU's end. Prestige, hopefully so, opportunities. But I found it really interesting, the two words that are rather small. And those were really scholarship and outside the box. I mean, nobody really thought of this. In the end, I need you as a faculty member to contribute way more than just going to class and maybe engaging in a few activities. And there's a lot on campus, isn't there? If I could tell you one thing, focus. There are too many things happening every day. Focus on what's really important. And so we're really gonna concentrate on scholarship and outside the box. And I have a couple activities for you. If you read my little blurb, my couple paragraphs, that was published a couple years ago. It talked about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and how it has moved from, and I guess I'm doing something not right. <laughs> Part of life is going with the flow. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But everybody knows about the Nobel Prize. I don't know if you've heard this quote before though. The said interest shall be divided into five equal parts. And by the way, since I'm a scientist, some of this will be about science, other parts will not. This is, which shall be apportioned as follows. One part of the person who shall have made the most important chemical discovery or improvement. And this is from Alfred Nobel, who happens or happened to be a chemist. And so all these people on the list are giants in my field of chemistry. I mean, if you look way at the top, 1950, Diels and Alder for organic synthesis. And just this year, 2012, we have the Nobel Prize in G proteins. But if you pick it apart, you discover a couple things. There's a lots of awards up there that are just single investigators, but there's a number up there that actually include more than one person and not a, just one, more than one person, more than one country. And so the ones that I've circled there, they come from different areas. And it could be that they have partnerships, but it could be that they were working on similar areas and uh, the Nobel Prize went to both at the same time. So what I wanna show you is, 
it may take more than just one person doing similar things at the same time. Huge honor, Nobel Prize. If you're into money, um, it'll get you about 1.2 million currently if you can get a hold of the Nobel Prize. Not bad. So, I know you're here. You're taking classes. You're looking for grades. I need more than that out of you. And what do I need out of you? I need you to be a problem solver, plain and simple. Because I don't necessarily need a new dashboard in my car. I don't need someone or another person that can do a heart transplant. I really need somebody who can solve um, significant problems. And I give you six here. You don't have to solve them today, so don't worry. But you can imagine economic collapse, water, education, climate change, oil, species extinction. There are people on both sides of the aisle of these issues, and I'm certainly not gonna take one side over the other, but maybe just frame them for you and tell you that there are problems out there that we're gonna have to solve at some point. If my generation can't do it, then it's gonna be you guys, right? I know, we're all familiar with the economic collapse, not just of the US, but across the world, and we heard it during the recent elections. It's been very fragile, everywhere from Greece to the US. Somebody in economics is gonna have to help us at some point. How about the water issue? So over the last 50 years, population has tripled. Well, industrial pollution, unsustainable agriculture, and poor planning have just done us wrong. So we're gonna have to have some planners too. Um, species extinction, I don't know where you sit on this. I have some ideas. But it is interesting to think about. If you get rid of a frog, it may impact me or you. And the whole oil thing, that was a part of our elections. How do we get rid of oil? Or do we even need to? I mean, do we have enough around that we'll be okay? And the whole climate change, that may have the biggest number of arguments. Now, the one that I have here with education is definitely, for me, connected with the US. Yeah, we, we have been a power for a long time. But as the statement says, taking a US-centric perspective may not be so fantastic. And we're becoming more fragile in terms of education and not as big of a powerhouse as we have been. So at some point, the educators are gonna have to help us out too. So if you're not a science major, but you're an educator or a poli-sci major, we need y'all. It's gonna have to happen. And don't even get me started on the state of Illinois. I mean, I wish that I could say, before we leave tonight, I'd like for all of us to identify just one that in 20 years would be our governor, and then maybe things would go okay. I wish it would be that easy. I know, space exploration has been said and done. But I'm curious, do you know why? Since the 60s, we've had 170 US manned space missions. Since May 24th, 2011, we haven't had any. Does anybody know why we no longer have manned space missions? I mean, is it, is it not important? or there's nothing else to see out there? I mean, what is it? Do you know this? Somebody take a stab. We don't have enough rockets, we don't have enough funding. Yeah, I mean, that could be it. Yeah, we have enough rockets. We just sent one to, was it LA? Yeah, LA, now it's in the, in the museum. So money is an issue, that whole economy thing. So I give you kind of a project here. It, it's a little ridiculous, I, I have to admit this. Have you ever heard of a space elevator? Anybody who has, raise their hand. A few of you. Good, I'm gonna need your help because I'm not a space elevator expert. Um, there are some benefits. So if the cost is important, most of the cost is where? It's in the first 
10 seconds going from Cape Canaveral up to outer space. Once you're up there, you're usually OK in terms of cost. But certainly, there's more to learn out there. Space exploration, transportation. I know I've heard some people say, hey, we could just eject our trash out into space. That's probably not a good idea. Because you know that comes back to haunt you at some point. <laughs> Like the second Earth then throws their trash at you. I mean, um, technology, we have lots of communication in space that would love to use this. And the whole idea of colonization kind of makes my stomach kind of queasy. I'm not terribly interested in that. But maybe some other people are. Just to give you some history, I don't know if you know how old this idea is. 1895, Solkovsky, a Russian guy, published this manuscript talking about a space elevator. And where did he get the idea? You know, he saw the Eiffel Tower and how tall it was. And during that time, I mean, that was probably the biggest structure there was. And he thought, well, could we not just build more on top of the Eiffel Tower and make it to outer space? OK, it's an idea. And it wasn't really until 1967 that people really started to consider this as a viable opportunity. There's been some other publications. They all talk about this. So is it really lunacy or is it good sense? I mean, what, what is going to be required to get this done? So I give you a couple parameters. Here they are. We got the Earth. What people have come up with is you're going to need a counterweight. So if you've ever played with a rope or a string, you've got a weight on the end and you rotate around, that's what's going to happen. And so that counterweight is out in space. And once you get what they call a climber up into space, you just get off and you're weightless. I mean, how tough can that be? Some other parameters. Um, you have to make it beyond the geosynchronous orbit. Oh, and by the way, um, the center of mass is at about 22,000 miles. The counterweight is at 67,000 miles. So these are the parameters. And so is this really out there? And what is it going to take to do this? And what are some issues? Well, it goes well beyond technology. And there is some. For example, climber propulsion. How do you get something from Earth all the way up there? But also, you may want to consider political climate. But how about environmental impact? I mean, you've got to think about these things. So what I'd like you to do, connect with two, three, four, five people around you. And I want you to consider this question. What do you see as the three significant challenges related to the design, installation, and use of space elevators? I mean, how are you going to get this thing to work? Even if you don't believe in it, help me figure this out. Go. <laughs> what? Nobody's going to sit with you? I'm a loner, too which was just caught on tape. Fantastic.
Okay. I have too many things in my pocket. So I could tell that you started off talking about this and then you drifted, didn't you? At least some of you. <laughs> All right, so help me. What are some significant challenges related to this that you came up with in the back? Excellent. However, I, I guess I didn't do my job. So you know that this is not the moon. It's just a weight up there that has to counterbalance the cable. The moon is somewhere else. Oh, do you need more time now, now that we've defined that? <laughs> yes. We could have issues if it's too far out. But believe me, even at 67,000 miles, you're not close. Yes? As it continues to move, the cable is going to be hitting the atmosphere. It's going to put a giant line circle in the atmosphere. So like a Chicago cutlery knife, just carving its way. Yeah, I like that. Definitely some issues. Yes? You know, that is excellent. Um, they, if you do the calculations, it actually slows the Earth down ever so slightly. But yeah. OK, so that could be an issue. Who else? In the back. Are you talking about? <laughs> Oh, so how do you get the elevator from the earth up to the counterweight? I'm with you. How do you do that one? <laughs> well, you just step off. No, right. How do you get back down? The counterweight, right. Good question. I hope you're not looking at me for an answer. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is where it starts, right? With a question. Who else has one? Okay, the cable. So I have held on to a number of long ropes, but I can't remember any that have been 67,000 miles. I mean, that, that just seems ridiculous. And what, what do you make that out of? How long would the, the ride be? How fast are you going? <laughs> right, how long would the ride be? Would it be half my life? That would not be worth it. That would not be worth it. Anybody else? <laughs> what do you do about things hitting you? Because <laughs> I would rather not have that happen. All right, I got question two. This one's related to your major. What are the opportunities that this actually provides? And specifically for your major of expertise. So I was sitting next to somebody who's in journalism. What expertise from your field of study could enhance the development of this project? So whether you're engineering, English, art, chemistry, I want to talk, I want you guys to talk among yourselves. What could this possibly provide in terms of an opportunity? So what's your majors back here? How much money would that 
So, how does it connect? I think they're going to develop some sort of space madness. The, the whole lunacy thing is going to come to reality. I like that. Tell me. He, he made a joke about it. He said I would have to write elevator music. Yeah, could you imagine the music? Right, this would take it to a new level. How are you? Good. What's your major? And so, how does chemistry connect here? You and I can talk the same language. Well, I can probably think of several uses that you could probably have for a vacuum up there, but my real problem with it is that it's physically impossible to do that because it's just physically impossible to make that where you wouldn't just fall back down. Because that's the way that satellites stay up. That's why you're weightless. Right. So, so think of that counterweight as a satellite. So if it's beyond our atmosphere, it, it should not be falling back to Earth, right? Well, the problem with that is that, uh, like, uh, the way a satellite works is that when it's going around, it's actually falling towards the Earth, and you're falling at the same rate as everything around you. So you only seem weightless, and it's the uh, centripetal force and the fact that you're going around in a circle that's making you seem like you're staying up. It's, falling back to Earth very, 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 very slowly, but it's still falling. And when you have it immobilized at one point in its center on the, on the planet, gravity, it's just going to pull you straight back down, walk down that force. So what about centrifugal force? Things spinning around. Well, that's all fine. The weight will stay up there, but anything like an elevator, So this is what we have to do, is solve this problem. Yeah. Let's go down, I'm going to go down and see what other people think. That was good. All right, I'm back. So did you find a connection between your major and the project? Help me, somebody. Anybody poli sci? I know. Um, finance major. Finance. And I guess like if they, if this thing becomes like really popular, it's easily investable, like, stock market stuff. Yeah, and and where do you get the money to finance this thing? Because it's Probably. it's not a few dollars. <laughs> However, it could be attractive to many different groups. I mean, who would be attracted to this? I'm not. I'm not. You're not. <laughs> No, yeah, it, it could catch on. It could catch on. Somebody else. I saw hands. Yep. Okay. Yep. Hopefully, we don't need a propulsion engine. But maybe. Maybe that's the way to go. Anybody, I, I said this, anybody poli sci? So, how would that come into play? <laughs> right. Can't we just put it in the ocean? <laughs> Absolutely. And when you go up a couple miles, whose space is that? It, it could get uh, ugly. Yeah. No kidding. Somebody else. So this one's out here, but is anybody in the humanities like clay and ceramics or pencil drawing or anybody in art? I mean, how does this connect? Paints and space. Is there a connection? Well, our world without art, what happens? It, it's not as fun, is it? I mean, we're a community. Whether we're building a ridiculous space elevator, 
Yeah, it, it's not the same place. I have an example in just a couple minutes about chemistry and art. Somebody else. Okay. We're not going to do the third question, but I'd like for you to think about this. I mean, what partnerships would you have to make for this thing to succeed? And I know you're all shaking your head. This is never going to happen, ever. Well, I hate to tell you, there's a, there's a company called the Lyft Group. A couple years ago, they had 35 PhDs working on this very project, and I, I'm sure they have more now. The issue, and there's only one, it all comes together, and that is, what's the rope? So the climber is no problem. We're gonna use electrical vehicles, at least that's what they say, and they're gonna be po uh, powered by solar energy. They're gonna go about 200 miles an hour, 15 ton payload. If you do the math, it's about nine minutes. Poof. The anchor is important. So whatever is attached to the earth, I know, is it in the ocean or is it somewhere else? It's gonna have to be able to withstand 200 tons of upforce. Definitely doable. You gotta come up with a counterweight and what is that gonna be? But it's this thing, it's the tether that is an issue. And, and think about this one. You're standing underneath the space elevator and the thing breaks at uh, 59,000 miles. Where is it coming? Back down on top of you. Um, so that would not be good. You can't make it out of steel, it just weighs too much. So I'll tell you how technology may be fixing this in science. What I have shown here is actually a sheet of graphite that is rolled into a tube. And here's a bunch of them. If you put them together, you're gonna to need something about three feet wide, two millimeters thick, and that'll work. These carbon nanotubes are 30 times stronger than steel and way, way lighter. So even though it seemed ridiculous, um, it's doable. They can now make these tubes. They don't know how to make them 62,000 miles long. That, that they don't know how to do yet. But even though it seems totally ridiculous, somewhere in the end, somebody may be doing this. And like I said, it's gonna require more than one discipline and it's gonna need art, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Okay, I move on. Oh, speaking of art, <laughs> I've always been fascinated with M.C. Escher. I'm sure you've seen most of these, if not all of them. You know, he, uh, was born in 1898, died in 1972 in Holland. He was a graphic artist, and he really started as an architect, which makes a lot of sense if you look at his pictures and figures and drawings. He mainly dealt with woodcuts, lithographs, and mesotints. Don't ask me what a mesotint is. And they were mathematically inspired. I mean, most of them featured some impossible construction, explorations of infinity and architecture, and you can see that in here. So he's got staircases that wrap together but are on different floors, that makes no sense. We have a waterfall that, that actually gets fed by itself. I wish we could have that. He really played with spaces and shapes and fish moving into, what is that, a goose? and how their spaces kind of came together. And the Mobius strip and shapes that kind of worked. Interesting. And people have used this and done their own thing. And they call it Escher-esque. So warping their heads and brains and, and you know, all this infinity kind of stuff. This one's a little disturbing and I'm gonna move on because it is. <laughs> But I want to tell you that Escher actually inspired some research that we did in our lab. I want to tell you how it happened. If you don't know anything about DNA, it's not that complicated. There's four base pairs. Thiamine and adenine have to pair together, and guanine and cytosine need to pair together, and if they don't, bad things happen. Um, they form a double helix back in the 50s. Who, who gets the Nobel Prize for that? Watson and Crick. And they got the data from who? 
Rosalind Franklin, by a glimpse of her photograph, they knew that it was a double helix. So there's an issue here. If you sit out in the sun too long, you get UV-induced DNA damage. So we form mutations, which are not good. And you can have three different forms. Acute, which is sunburn, transient. Over long periods of time, your immune defense system is depleted or chronic, which is mutations in skin cancer, melanoma. And I have a little movie here for you. I hope that we can see it. So these molecules right here are the thiamines. They went purple because they got excited because the person sat out in the sun. And you're gonna notice that new chemical bonds form. And it's coming, I promise. And there they are. It forms this four-membered ring between the thiamines, which is a mutation. And that's a part of melanoma. How bad is melanoma? Fastest growing class of cancer in the US. Top 10 most common cancers. For 2012, they're, they're projecting about 75, 76,000 new melanomas. About 10% will result in death. It accounts for about 5% of skin cancer cases. And the, here's the problem, and why we need problem solvers. There's been no significant advances in treatment or survival rate in the last 30 years. What do you do with that one? Well, you stay out of the sun. <laughs> Except that's not really an option. Okay, if you don't know chemistry, don't worry about it. Here's my thiamine molecules. There are carbon-carbon double bonds. When they see UV light, they form a four-membered ring. Here's that double helix. And here's my research group of the last year. There's no way that I could have done all this. It really requires help. And uh, actually, my students are better than I am usually. So if I am in the lab, they're usually telling me, you know, don't you have a paper to write or something? Okay. So here's M.C. Escher's famous drawing, two right hands drawing each other. And so we looked at this and were inspired. If I have two double bonds close to one another, couldn't I do something similar to what Escher is showing here? And it might look something like this. Two carbon-carbon double bonds. I somehow have to link them. In a DNA molecule, they are neighbors and they want to do this. But if I take small molecules in solution, they're tumbling everywhere, and there's no way to order them. So using Escher, you know, maybe if we did this, and then we irradiated it, we could form these four-membered rings. And if by doing that, we could understand the parameters behind photodimerization within DNA. And don't worry, I only have three slides of this, so I'm, I'm not going to hopefully bore you to death. And everything comes up with an idea, at least starts with an idea. We thought of these molecules as kind of fish hook shapes, where the groups on the end here are complementary and would form or provide some cohesive force. So if you had a blue molecule and a green one, they could form together, aligning the double bonds, and you could do the reaction and study this whole process very much related to melanoma. We've done lots of studies over the last two or three years. That molecule, or that idea of a molecule, actually sprouted into a real molecule. We thought that they would possibly form hydrogen bonds with those double bonds near each other, just like Escher's two hands. And we were going to functionalize them using amino acids, which is the cheapest form of chirality around. And if we could do that, we would irradiate them and form these four membrane rings. And on top of it, we're doing the chemical reactions inside of crystals that are less than a half of a millimeter. That's the idea. And here it is. Here's one of the students that have been in my lab. He was gracious enough to let me be along for the ride. <laughs> Very much inspired by M.C. Escher. Josh, presenting his work, funny enough, two years ago to the day, upstairs is the chemistry department having their research celebration, and that's exactly where this was two years ago. <laughs> and he got a paper, which was not only published, but it made the cover of crystal engineering communications. So there's those hydrogen bonded dimers, we irradiate them to form 
those patterns that have the four membered rings. So oftentimes I find that undergraduates don't think that they have enough expertise to do research or scholarship or create a creative activity. And I tell them, fat chance. Here at EIU, we have lots of fantastic things going on. I lifted these pictures from our website here at EIU. But it uh, gives you some ideas of what people have been doing. Here's chemistry up top here with Gopal Perianen and Gerald Presley, who's now at the University of Minnesota. Yes, That's where I'm from. <clears throat> but we also have lots of things going on in terms of scholarship, Tea Party, Tea Party media messages, and the importance of that. Here's Vince Skotowski. He's retired since then, but studying watersheds. And here's biology, looking at fungus and so on. We have lots of opportunities on our campus. So in, turn, in, in addition to being problem solvers, I want you to consider actually participating in scholarship. And how would you ever do that? And why would you ever do that? This is my last slide. Lots of opportunities, way more than I had a number of years ago. <clears throat> I want you to consider partnering with an EIU faculty. In English, they do it differently. I think the student comes up with their project and they're kind of mentored. In chemistry, I've never seen a student say, oh, here, I have an idea for the cure for cancer. I've never seen it happen. I mean, it could. And we have uh, opportunities during the academic year in summer. Um, in chemistry, I know that we're doing both. And the summer is definitely our bread and butter, and same with lots of other departments. You got to know there's money out there in terms of scholarships and awards. The Honors College has uh, plenty of opportunities, funds for the summer. It's definitely competitive, but you should be aware of it. And my mantra has always been for my students, you don't get what you don't apply for. I mean, you might as well apply. The College of Sciences, this is new, travel money for undergraduates to present your work somewhere. And the Booth Library, um, this doesn't really apply to the sciences. Maybe it does. Awards for excellence in student research and creative acti activity. It's really the use of library resources, an award for that. Most departments have resources for research and creative activities. And I want you to consider this. Most undergraduates don't think that they can actually get a publication in the end. Rebecca Grove, uh, your dean was talking about, um, she is now at Iowa, is married, um, hopefully will get out in a few years. I think she recently told me that, um, I asked her what she wanted to do and, and she said, I'd like your job. I said, oh. Okay, all right, you can have that. But uh, amazing story. I told her about a story of Louis Pasteur from 1856. I said, this result makes no sense. No one's ever looked at it. Could you just, just go into the lab and try it once? And by the way, this is your first ever research experience. She had never been in a lab, tried it once, and got the cover of a journal called Angevante Chemie, number two in chemistry in the world, just shocking. So undergraduates, I love it because you guys have no idea what you don't know, which is beautiful. <laughs> Whereas a PhD student might say, it's never going to work. I'm not going to try it. You, you just never know. So our end, end game is publications and presentations. Here at EIU, we have a thing called SciFest that give out Sure Awards um, soon. We'll be going to the National Council on Undergraduate Research. I think this last year we had almost 20 undergraduates present their work at this conference, and I'm guessing we'll have similar numbers this coming April. Hopefully 40. 40? Hopefully 40. We have 44 applications. That's news to me. That's excellent. And for me, that's a, a huge indication of EIU um, promoting undergraduate research. All right. Last ones, and I'd really like for you to think about these. And if you think these are competitive over here, the Goldwater Scholarship, which Rebecca got a couple years ago and she was number one at EIU, first ever. There's 120, 150 in the nation 
is all they give out every year. We now have two. We'd like to have three. And then some. There's certainly other national honors awards and initiatives. And there's lots of summer opportunities. And I think because you're in the honors college, you have to think about doing something some summer. You should be thinking about it now. If you're in the sciences, lots of opportunities at national labs and certainly NSF. And my, oh, I did say that was my last slide. Here's the last one. I know. You think honors is all about dedication and challenge, intelligence and prestige and opportunities. I've seen lots of students fall even though they were pretty smart. But I really need you to be dedicated and a scholar and thinking way outside the box. I know you have to do your classes and we need you to get good grades, but it's beyond that. So where are you headed after that? And thank you for your time.